test blade, oops, this cube. Perhaps each and every one of us, right? At one point of our lives, we have played, or at least even touched, this little 3D piece of puzzle and attempted with the best of our abilities to finally solve it. Have you succeeded? Me too. Well, over the years, I have learned that there is just one simple trick that we can do to succeed in this mind-boggling challenge. That is... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Throw the Rubik's Cube. Throw it as hard as you can, especially when you're already so frustrated, until it finally breaks into pieces, or perhaps you can just tear them apart, and then start building the puzzle again, putting the right colors in the right places, piece by piece by piece. Until, yeah, you've finally solved the puzzle. Well, in reality, I'm sure you know that it's not the way we solve things. In reality, we could have just break things into pieces and then build everything again back from scratch. Perhaps this Rubik's Cube might give us some insights on how we should be looking at things around us, and most importantly, on how we should be looking at our health and our healthcare systems. What do I mean by that? We all love numbers, I do love numbers. So let me start by giving you some numbers. We know that health can be represented by various indicators such as child mortalities, disease prevalence, saying all the technical stuff. But for now, let's focus on life expectancy or the number of years of life a person born today is expected to live. If you were born in Australia back in 1970, average life expectancy is already at 67 years old for males and then even higher for females at 74 years old. That's according to the data from the World Bank. It even improved over the years. If you're born in 2010, life expectancy is already at 79 for males, and again, even higher for females, sorry guys, who tend to live longer, at 83 years old. But the situation across the world is, of course, not the same as that of Australia's. At the other side of the world, we have countries like Sierra Leone, for example, who is also one of the badly hit Ebola-affected areas. Now, if we look at data in Sierra Leone back in 1970, can you guess what the average life expectancy is? Average life expectancy is 30 years less than that of Australians. That's only 37 for males and 45 for females. Well, yeah, it improved. In 2010, life expectancy is already at 50 for males and 60 for females. Well, still less than that of Australia's 1970 figures, but has definitely improved. But is that change significant enough? Is it already a solid proof for us so that we can say things are working well? Should that be our only parameter? I've mapped out life expectancy across the years, and if you look at the African and Asian regions here, you can definitely notice that our hot spots, the reddish ones or darker shades, where people die at their prime adult years are actually decreasing over the years. But then again, can we assess our progress in healthcare just by looking at health outcomes alone? To answer that, let me give you a quick story. Well, my story. I was born, as said, in the Philippines, and back there, life is so much different than that of Australia's. Upon graduating university, I've started working in the hospital. Wanting to gain so much experience, I'd spend mornings at the dialysis unit of a big private tertiary hospital, and some nights working, delivering babies at a small community maternity health center. Just by working in these two different institutions alone, I've seen the huge difference in terms of health access between the rich and the poor. Here at this big private hospital, you'd see people with 24-7 nurses at their bedside. But back here at the maternity health center, you meet pregnant women who never even had any chance at all to access prenatal care. Hence, health is not just about health. Health is related to financing and how much of these services can we access. But the story doesn't end there. During weekends, I'm in the mental hospital. Well, working there, and as I'm working there, I've seen treated people who never even wanted to go back to their communities anymore. They were scared that their families wouldn't accept them. Health is not just as well about the cure. Health requires a more holistic quality service delivery. But I think after all those stuff, I've had a change of heart. 
I then started working for the government as part of the Presidential Human Development Policy Staff Officers. Long name. The one thing I learned so much is this. Health is definitely political. Governance matters a lot. Would you give more to health over other sectors such as education, labor, political or foreign interest? Health is related to a lot more other factors, as reflected by this WHO health systems framework and a lot more frameworks that are being used out there. And as you travel to different countries, you realize that all the problems are not just local. It's definitely global. You see it in other parts of Asia, you see it in Africa, it's everywhere. Health, again, therefore, is not just about health. It's connected to a lot more other factors and the picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we move along. But some of you know all this stuff all too well. The challenge is, how are we to use what we know? How are we to use what data we have, not just on health outcomes like life expectancy, but also our data on governance, on financing, on service delivery, and many other factors related to our health to inform our decisions and our actions, both locally and globally. Doing this, we are rewriting the rules of how we can better deliver our healthcare services. The idea behind our research is simple. Inspired by all these, and can be explained in simple terms by, I have one more, the Rubik's Cube. First, is to see what patterns can we see behind the complexity of our data on our health systems. Each block of the cube is similar to each of the factors affecting our health. Moving one will definitely affect all the others. So we have to know which blocks to move first. For example, in our findings, we are slowly understanding as to why, despite increasing health investments in Africa, health outcomes are still poor. Children are still dying. We are providing evidence as to why increasing controls for corruption and ensuring political stability also matters a lot for our health. Second is to see what's the easiest way for us to address the puzzling issues of our health. How can we reduce the number of steps we need to take to achieve our health goals? For example, in Afghanistan, after the wars, they've pioneered what we call a balanced performance scorecard system that many others have claimed to be successful in improving service capacity and service delivery. We are now finding out how such assessment methods can also be used to determine more efficient and effective measures, particularly in reconstructing health infrastructures of our post-conflict affected areas. Using all these findings, we are hoping to get a better way of performance monitoring and evaluation for our global health systems. Just think about it. Why do we have to wait for our diseases to manifest its symptoms before we can even intervene? Why did Ebola had to rise into such alarming global rates? Using global health metrics, we might not need anymore to wait for our health systems to be once again thrown and broken into pieces before we can even intervene. We might not have to wait for our health systems to fall apart. Perhaps this Rubik's of health will give us an answer. And solving it is a challenge for each of us to think about. Thank you.